Vroom. You hear that? That's you upgrading your engine to run faster. It sounded a lot better in my head. Uh, this is Need for Speed Part 2. Learn to train to run faster. Welcome back to the Omega Sports Learn to Run podcast. My name is Dr. Matt Minard, pronounced my nerd for a reason, and I am honored to be your host. If you are new, welcome. Here's how it works. You vote on the topic, and then I create content around that topic on all my social media platforms. If you are a regular, welcome back. I'm blown away by how many people have been tuning in. If for some reason you feel compelled to watch this episode, I'm going to start posting these to my YouTube. Let me give you a little refresher. This is part two on how to run faster. Last episode was about technique. It was the mechanics to run faster right now. And those three were, you need to make sure you're leaning forward, make sure your arms are assisting your legs, and don't jump. Those three, three things you can immediately apply to your mechanics and get faster. Now we're talking about training. This episode is how can we train to get faster, to upgrade your engine. So there's three training strategies I want to talk about to run faster. The first is intervals, where it's a work to active recovery where you want to walk. The second is intervals where it's a work to active recovery where you need to walk. And the third and final is strengthen your tush. When you push with the tush, get more out with the push. <laughs> that sounds terrible, but <laughs> we're trying to get more push out of your tush. That's the third one. So here we go. Let's make this simple. If the goal is to run faster, you must run faster. All right, hope you enjoyed this episode. I want to thank my friends at Omega Sports. Can you imagine if that was all I did? Like, honestly, what would you do? Would you ever, I wouldn't listen to me again. Would you ever listen again if I just cut the episode off right there? Can you imagine? But uh, let's get into some background first. Before we go into those big three, let's uh, lay some ground rules or some background. What is interval training? What is it? Interval training is breaking up and organizing a run by two components, effort and duration. Effort is simply how hard you work or intensity. A lot of times those will be interchanged, effort and intensity. Duration or time is how long will you be maintaining that level of exertion? Example, we can organize a 10 minute run we do one minute of running and one minute of walking. If we repeat that for five rounds, that's an interval session. That's 10 minutes of interval running. So great question. How can we measure or define effort? How can we measure this? You, I know this isn't going to surprise you, but I'm going to use an analogy. And I'm going to really shock you because it's a car analogy. I know, I know. So think about it this way. Your body is a car. You've got three gears, three different speeds. Gear one is like driving in the neighborhood speed. Gear two is driving in the city a little bit faster. Gear three is highway. So your next question is, Matt, how do we know what gear we're actually using? When we're exerting ourselves? how do we know which gear we're in? There's a lot of different ways we can do this. The one that I like the most that gets the best feedback that people seem to understand it is when you're exerting yourself, we can measure your ability to talk. Your ability to talk at that moment can give us insight to which gear you're in. So for example, and we call this the talk test. If you're in gear one, you should be able to exert yourself to the point where you could hold a conversation. Doesn't mean you do, but you could hold a conversation. Gear two is where you exert yourself to the point where you could get a few words out between breaths, but not a full sentence. 
Gear three is our one word response. You don't want to talk as it is, but if you had to, you could only get one word out at a time. That tells you you're in gear three. Example, one person, this could be their three gears. Gear one, they're uh, 10 minutes per mile pace. Their gear two speed is a nine minute per mile pace. Their gear three is an eight minute per mile pace. So there's an inverse relationship with the harder that you work, the less duration or less time you can spend there. And that should make sense, but it will clear up more as we go. So for the first one, the first training strategy, we're gonna talk about interval training with recovery where you want to walk. You don't need to, you want to walk. Simply put, we're gonna fluctuate between running faster and running slower. Or with our gear example, gear two or city driving speed, pulling back to gear one or neighborhood speed. Here's an example of a session. You could do 30 seconds of gear two, 90 seconds of gear one, and you would repeat that for 10 rounds. So here's how this would go. You set your timer, first 30 seconds, you're in gear two. You're thinking, I'm exerting myself to the point where I know I can still go back to gear one, AKA not walk. So that 30 seconds, that's what you're thinking. I'm putting my foot down on the gas just enough that I know I can still come back and still run at a slower speed or gear one. Here's what's gonna happen. Beep, you've got your 90 seconds of gear one. Here's what you'll think. I really want to walk. I really want to walk. Here's what you should think. I'm recovering. Don't make any judgments. When you first pull back, it doesn't feel good right away. It doesn't. You want to walk. But just like with everything in life, if we endure, if we push ourselves, nothing is, is forever. Everything's temporary. That feeling of discomfort, it's so short-lived. You just have to hold on. And in my mindset, I immediately flip a switch, recovery mode. Every second that goes by, I think my heart rate's lowering. I'm recovering. Next thing you know, 90 seconds is up. You feel more like yourself. Beep, gear two again for 30 seconds. You tell yourself, okay, I got this. It's only 30 seconds. I can do anything for 30 seconds. Beep, same process. Mind games, you keep telling yourself. And it's this active recovery. I like looking at the heart rate response after in reflection and learning. So if you were to look at your heart rate response on an interval training like this, where you want to walk and we're fluctuating between different speeds of running, but not stopping and walking, we'll see what we call rolling hills, where the heart rate response, the harder that you work, the more oxygen your legs, your body needs, your heart pumps more, get more blood, we'll see the heart rate go up. So we'll see this kind of ups and down where the heart rate doesn't go super, super high and it doesn't go super, super low. It's this kind of middle, up and down, up and down. And here's the reason why this helps. With time, your body will adapt to allow you to run at faster speeds without fatiguing. Let me say that again. With time, your body will adapt and will allow you to run at faster speeds without fatiguing. Next up, another interval. But this time, the recovery is gonna be such that you need to walk, you are going to walk. So how can we deserve that? What, what would we do to make that worthwhile or challenging? Well, simply put, we're gonna fluctuate between running really fast and walking. Gear three, is our highway driving speed. Gear zero is our walking. We're not saying rest. There's a big difference between rest and recovery. And we call this active recovery where you're still moving. Here's an example. 30 seconds of gear three, 90 seconds of gear zero for 10 rounds. 
you're thinking for 30 seconds, I need to earn this walk. I need to walk. I'm going to get three times the amount of recovery that I do the work. That's going to justify it in your head. That's the ask. That's the justification of why. So here's how this one goes. For the first 30 seconds of running, you think, I'm exerting myself to the point where I need to walk. I want to earn it. Beep. Gear zero. You're walking. Ah. Thank goodness, I got 90 seconds to walk. What you will immediately think is there's no way I'm gonna be able to do that again. What you should think is no judgments. Don't judge yourself. You're recovering. Remember, you're not you when you don't have blood to your brain. It's not you talking. It's that subconscious that's trying to hold you back all the time. Don't listen to it. You have a choice. Next thing you know, okay, I got this. I can do that again. I'm gonna do beep 30 seconds. I got this. I can do anything for 30 seconds. Next thing you know, it's over. What we will see with this is the heart rate response will be peaks and valleys. So we'll see your heart rate go higher than it did with the rolling hills or the last intervals. And we will see the heart rate response go even lower. So you ask, Matt, how can this help to make me faster? Great question, whoever you are. This will allow you to unlock your potential. Unlock your potential by preventing fatigue from occurring at slower speeds. How? You've probably heard of lactic acid before. Lactic acid is a byproduct of muscle function, muscle metabolism. When the levels get high in our bloodstream, the more we work, it causes us to fatigue. I like to think of it like an engine of a car. When it's working, you've got some fumes that are created. The faster you go, the more fumes. You can get to a point where the fumes will stall out the engine. But by us doing this, we're getting to that point where we're not going to that point of stalling out. But with time, you'll see your body will be able to be more efficient at handling oxygen, getting oxygen to your, your body, to your muscles. And it gets more efficient at getting rid of lactic acid. So there's another analogy that I'm going to give you here. I debated on whether to include this or not. My thought was, you know, even if a few people find this helpful, then it's worth doing. So I hope this hits home. I want to say an analogy of kind of what more causes that fatigue and how with this type of training and how uh, increasing the stimulus or the effort, how we can adapt over time. So here it is. Your body is like a canoe. I know another canoe analogy. In that canoe, you've got four rowers. Each rower has a paddle. That's your muscles. Those are your muscles. They are what's responsible for creating forward motion. We've talked about the push with the tush. The paddle goes in the water. You push the water back. The boat goes forward. The canoe goes forward. But here's where it gets a little bit more detailed, but hopefully still simple. Imagine that water is like lactic acid. What happens is these guys, these four rowers, when they first start running, they're not super efficient, just like everybody. They're not great at their job yet. And what happens is when they put the paddle on the water and they push back in that process, as a result, they are gonna get some water that splashes back into the boat. That's that lactic acid. Well, what happens? They're not in sync at first. They're not super great at working harder and paddling faster. The faster they paddle, they get more water into the boat. And what happens is they'll get to a point where what? It will sink. That's that wall. That's that fatigue point. With time, with trading adaptations, with going harder and getting more efficient, what we'll see is, one, the, the four members get more in sync. They get better. They're more efficient at creating only the amount of energy needed to uh, propel forward. The other thing is I didn't mention is our body is incredible. There's a fifth member in that boat that their job is they've got a bucket. And they take that bucket and they're just constantly picking up some of the water in the boat and they're scooping it out outside of the boat. That's that lactic acid. That's that buffer. And so with time, what happens is, one, less water, less lactic acid gets into the boat, and two, the bucket even gets bigger. 
we can do a better job of getting the lactic acid out. So I hope you found that helpful to kind of conceptualize with time, what are some of these adaptations that happen? What causes that fatigue, that stalling, that drowning of the boat, and where you need to stop for it to actually recover? So I, I hope you found that, found that helpful. So some other pro tips on doing interval training. Please don't just count out the time. It's, we can only focus on one thing, and I don't want you to focus on counting. You can use smartwatches, GPS watches, there's a ton of apps out there. There's timers you can get. And I'm going to post a link to um, examples of what you could use and video demonstrations of me actually setting this up. One of my favorite places to do intervals is actually on a treadmill. And the reason why is I can learn a lot. You can learn so much about your speed, about how fast you go at your different gears where it can become methodical. I got to a point where I knew exactly if I was in gear two, I knew what pace I was going to be able to withstand and withhold. I knew what pace I could recover. And the crazy thing is when I first started doing it, I could recover at 5.5 to 6 miles per hour. With time, I can recover at a faster speed. I actually got to a point where I could recover at 8.5 miles per hour or around a seven minute per mile pace where I could run 630, six minute pace for two to three minutes pull back. Doesn't feel great right away. You're like, oh, I hate this. Why do I do this? And then slowly you're like, all right, I got this. And with time, you're able to recover. That's the most amazing thing is active recovery where not stopping and just continuing to move. Those adaptations are incredible. And doing this on a treadmill, you'll get to learn your speeds of when this actually takes place at your gears. Some strategies to progress or regress. Let's say you had an interval workout and you felt like it just didn't go according to plan. What can you do? Well, you can repeat it and try again, but if you wanna set yourself up for success, you can adjust the ratios. What do I mean by that? In the examples I used earlier, it was 30 seconds of work, 90 seconds of recovery. That's a one to a three ratio. We're getting three times the amount of recovery to work. What we can do is we can change it up. Same amount of work, only 30 seconds, but only give us 60 seconds of recovery. So what does that do? It actually makes it more challenging. So I can fluctuate. I can vary the amount of time that I have for recovery. If you think of it that way, you can make it easier. You can make it harder. And I will, in my training plans, this is what I'll do each week. We start to switch up the ratios where at first, I'm actually getting more recovery than I am work. I'm loving it. And then with time, I don't need that much recovery. And I'm doing where at first it was 30 seconds of uh, gear two and 90 seconds of gear one. I flip it up. I do 90 seconds of gear two and only 30 seconds of gear one. So you can fluctuate the intervals and the ratios to your advantage or to just set yourself up for success or challenge yourself. So the third was strength training, increasing the, the push and the tush. So we're now we're shifting the focus away from the heart and lungs. Because remember, the name of the game was oxygen. We're just trying to, our muscles are expensive tissues. They require a lot of oxygen. It's kind of like my girlfriend and coffee. She, if she's going to do some work, she needs a lot of coffee. Our muscles, the more that we work them, they need more oxygen. And guess who's responsible for that? The lungs bring it in from the atmosphere, the heart disperses it through the blood and gets it to your body. So those were the main intervals helps mainly with the heart and the lungs. But now the muscles, the muscles themselves. Remember back, it seems forever ago, episode one, talking about the calf muscles. And I talked about how our muscles, M muscles, are our movers. They create movement. What we're trying to do now is we're going to try to upgrade the amount of movement that's produced. Think back to that paddle analogy. When I push back the same effort, I wanna get more bang for my buck. I wanna create more forward propulsion by doing strength training. So this is super important. I'm gonna say this twice, because that's how important it is. For strength training to be beneficial, you have to challenge the muscles how and more than running. One more time. 
for strength training to be beneficial, you have to challenge the muscles how and more than running. Let's break that down. How? We need to work the muscles that are specific to running. A baseball player and a volleyball player are going to have different strength training programs and routines. We've got to be specific. We want to train the muscles that we use with running for this to be beneficial. Sometimes you'll hear that called specificity of training. Next was more. We have to challenge the muscles more. And so ways that we challenge the muscles more than running is we can increase time under tension or the amount of time that muscle is working more than it is during running for longer periods of time. We can increase the load. Running is all body weight, but we can increase and add some weight when appropriate. And we can increase the excursion or the range of motion to challenge a muscle more. So our muscles have three functions when it comes to movement, three functions. Our muscles create movement, they control movement, and they can slow movement. So some examples, creating movement, that's my thing, the push with the tush, trying to use your glutes, your hip extensors, to drive you forward. You push the earth back, it drives you forward. That's producing and creating movement. Then there's controlling movement, our core. I've talked before about your hip, your queen of the glutes, the gluteus medius. Gluteus maximus is the king. Gluteus medius is a hip abductor on the outside of your hip. That works on keeping your pelvis stable to create force off of. We need this stable foundation to produce force and movement. And the final one was slowing movement. That's where muscles act what we call eccentrically or they lengthen under, under load. So I talk about the quads. Old misconception, our quads are not the engine. Our quads should be like the shock absorber of a car. When you land, you'll see this kind of lowering of the body towards the ground. That's that dampening, that's that absorbing of the body weight, the ground reaction force. And the quad is extremely helpful in this uh, particular moment. Where it's not as helpful is when you leave the ground, we talked about you don't wanna jump. Your quads jump. You don't wanna jump. So we don't wanna use your quads in the propulsion phase. This is gonna sound, this is gonna hopefully put this into perspective for you. If you lived in a world where you only ran on flat surfaces, only ran on flat, never hit hills ever, you wouldn't need to strength train your quads and your calves. Let me let that sink in. The only time you should use your quads and your calves when running forward is if you're increasing your elevation, if you're going higher. That's what hills are. Otherwise, when going flat, we don't need to use them. So most of us, we don't live in a world without hills, so it is important that we do still do some strengthening for the quads. So I'm going to post a routine that has pictures and videos of this, but I still want to go over uh, two key concepts when it comes to uh, efficient or proper strength training. So I talked about that the muscles control movement. Think about this. If I am standing on a slab of cement versus standing on a slab of sand, which example do you think I could create more force, I could jump higher if I'm standing on a more firm, stable surface like concrete or a softer surface? The more stable. We need that stable foundation, that core, to be able to act to produce force on. So I always teach this first with running mechanics, with strength training, is what I call the stable stack learning how to stand, knowing gravity is always going down. How can I align my body such that gravity is working with me and not against me? The stable stack. If you're in a place you can safely do this, I'm going to walk and talk you through this and we'll have visuals that will be posted. But I'm going to take you through the three steps of the stable stack. Step one is the stack. Align your hips vertically over your ankles. Repeat with your shoulders over your hips. 
Step two, I call this accepting the stinky log or setting your shoulder blades. First, you're gonna bend your elbows to 90 degrees to make an L, and then you're simultaneously going to drop your shoulder blades and open your palms up. That sets your shoulder blades back. I like to say your shoulder blades are precious. Keep them in your back pocket. The third and final step is the most challenging, but it's arguably the most important. We're gonna to try to get neutral spine by thinking of the pelvis like a bowl. We're gonna to try to get that bowl level. So what you're gonna do is we're going to accomplish that by this. We're still standing in this L position. Minimize the low back curve by simultaneously engaging the glutes to tuck the tailbone down and the abdominals to lift the pelvis up. So most of us, we stand that bowl of water, it's spilling out of the front. When you reduce the curve, when you tuck the glutes down, abs up, it makes that bowl of water level. If you were to be standing at a mirror, you would look to the side, you would see a straight line through the center of your shoulders, through your hips, and through your ankles. This position, this is neutral. Now we can build. Now we can start to challenge the stability. This position that you're in now, what if we just took you horizontal when we put your forearms on the ground? That's a plank. That's the type of strengthening that we need or stability work, not the old school crunches and sit-ups. This. And ways that we can challenge this is even when you're horizontal, we could change the surface. If we're trying to challenge the stability, let's make the surface more unstable. Let's put a pad, a foam pad under the forearms. Let's take away a base of support or contact point to make it more challenging. We take away some support, the body has to make up for it. If you lift a foot off the ground, so now you've just got your two forearms, your, left, your one foot on the ground, your body's gonna have to make up for that and not give in to gravity. So that type of strengthening is so important in creating that foundation of uh, a stable base, a stable uh, core. Next that we're gonna go over is the tush push drill. It's so challenging. We sit on our butt all day. We have a hard time isolating, engaging. There's some common compensations that we'll do. I wanna take you through uh, tush push level one. And you can do it now, you can not. I'll have pictures of this, but I wanna talk you through a glute bridge, a glute bridge. Because we've all done bridges before, but I wanna make sure we do it right. We wanna use the glutes. So here's what this looks like. Here's the setup. I like you to take like a pillow and roll up a pillow so it's like a little foam roll, not all the way a foam roll because we don't want it moving on you, but we're trying to create this fulcrum. So I put this pillow horizontal along your upper back, around your shoulder blades. Next, you're gonna support the back of your head with your hands. We're not lifting our head up, our neck stays neutral. From there, I'm gonna bend my knees so my heels are closer to my butt and if you were to look, my knees are making like a, a 90 degree angle. I'm gonna lift my ankles up so the only thing touching the ground is my heels. Now here's what you're gonna do. You're going to imagine you're gonna pick up an acorn between your gluteals, your butt cheek. You're gonna drive through your heels and you're gonna to attempt to crush that acorn with your butt while lifting your hips up. At the top, you should be able to check Poke your glute on, not in your glute. Poke your tush and you'll feel it engaged. It's firm, it's contracted. That's telling you you're doing it. And then don't do what everybody does at first. Don't just let your glutes go and let gravity take you down. Make sure the glutes are then lowering. Drop the acorn. Sometimes people like a penny. I don't know why people like squishing a penny. Whatever your thing is. Acorns, quarters, dimes, no judgment here. But here's the conversation that we'll see we will see people use their back. They'll just arch their low back to bring their hips up and they don't use their glutes. And the low back's not meant to lift. It's not a good lever for that. So if we see somebody that is hips above horizontal, if they're hyperextending, the only way to do that is using your back. So I'll give the cue then, I should not feel the pressure increase between your shoulder blades on that pillow. I should not, you should not feel you push into the pillow while you're doing it. Because if you're doing that, then you're arching your low back. 
The second is we'll see people use the quads, not the glutes. So they'll push the ground down and forward. And the compensation we'll see for this is they'll slide vertical. They'll go upwards. So again, we're not trying to go upwards. The name of the game, we're trying to take the jump out of running. So this can be a great drill to isolate the glutes. Squeeze, contract, lift, stay contracted, lower. We can make it more challenging by going to a single limb support lifting yourself up with only one. This is how it works though. The progression from double leg is actually two up, one down. And what I mean by that is you use both legs to bring your hips up. Then you kick one leg out forward. So now there's only one foot on the ground. Your body's fighting gravity. Your pelvis wants to drop. Your core is working really hard. And then your glutes are working to lower. Then you reset two up, one down. You'll be able to do that before doing just lifting your body weight up. But here's the thing, if you can master this, if you can get where you can do 10 solid reps of just single leg, oh boy, your tush is going to be pushing like crazy, crazy. So this is one of my favorite exercises that we can then progress. And again, I'm going to post uh, actual pictures and a routine uh, of what this looks like on the social media platforms. So Matt, how does this all fit into a training plan? How does this all work? This is how I structure all my training plans in the Learn to Run Club. I have 5K through full marathon. They all do the same exact structure. Here's where it is. One long run a week, one run for distance. I found that train for time is safer, which I know you guys don't care about, that's me. But mentally, if you say, Matt, for 30 minutes, I want you to see how far you can get. That's the only cue. How far can you get in 30 minutes versus run three miles. It's a lot easier to digest mentally and physically by running for that time. And then you can say in the next time, hey, I wanna beat that time. But anyways, one long run a week where you're just running for a longer period of time for a longer distance. And that's usually on Sunday. Mondays is Mobility Monday. You're not running, I take you through kind of like a yoga, but just using your body for stretching, actual static stretching where you're trying to prep your body for undoing some of the stuff that we did from using it so much for thrunning and trying to open up your entire body, your thoracic spine, your lumbar spine, your hips, your everything. So that's all about movement Mondays, mobility Mondays. Tuesdays is track Tuesdays where it's that gear two to gear one where you're running at two different speeds. You're not walking and you're going back and forth for different ratios of time. So that's intervals on Tuesdays. Wednesdays is body weight Wednesdays and a recovery run. I show you what exercises to do to strengthen your legs, mainly with body weight. With some plans with time, we do increase the load with adding weight. And then you run after. And so you ask, why after? We want to put you at a disadvantage. We want to make your legs more tired and then go on a recovery run. It's, not, it's meant to be a recovery run. But you will get more benefit from that by fatiguing your legs out first and then running. It's a way we can make that run more challenging, more beneficial. Thursdays is intervals where we need to walk. That gear three, highway to walking or gear zero. Running really fast to walking. That's on Thursdays. Fridays is cross training. Here's the key. It took me a long time to realize this. Your heart doesn't know the difference of what you're doing. You get your heart rate up to 160 beats per minute, 160 beats per minute. It doesn't know if you're swimming, you're running, you're biking. On Fridays, I do cross training where we're trying to get your heart rate up, but take away the impact that when you hit the ground. We're already trying to take the jump out of running, but let's find another way to challenge your legs to increase your heart rate, increase your ability of your body to handle lactic, lactic acid, to improve oxygen consumption, and it doesn't have to be as running. And that's Fridays. Saturdays is off. I like to have one complete rest. And for a lot of you know, rest is one of the hardest things to do. And mentally, what I think on those days is I'm recovering. I am improving. All that work I did is just setting in place and I'm getting stronger. I'm getting faster and not feel like I'm wasting time because that's where most of the benefit comes is with that actual recovery. So I'm going to leave you with this, this life mantra. You can use this mantra with everything in life but especially for getting faster. It's by Fred DeVito. If it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. If we want to improve, if we want to progress, 
If we want to evolve, we have to increase the stimulus. If you're trying to run faster, we need to run faster. If we're trying to run for longer periods of time, we need to run for longer periods of time. We have to increase the stimulus. It doesn't have, just happen. I want to thank my friends at Omega Sports. They've been keeping the Carolinas moving forward for over 40 years. I highly recommend checking them out locally or online. Of note, the views and opinions of this show do not reflect those of Omega Sports. For better or for worse, they are my own. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can vote on the topics on my Instagram at learn.to.run, or you can email the show at info at learntorun101.com. I never thought I would be this person, but here I am. The ratings and reviews help so much. They help so much to allow my platform to grow, to reach more people. So I would greatly appreciate it if you could take a few seconds and to rate and review this podcast. I'd really appreciate it. The Omega Sports Learn to Run podcast will soon be available on all major platforms. Until next time, bye.